Howard Cherry and Rob Price, alumni of our college, propose initiating this lecture series to spotlight the character traits of today's successful leaders. We knew it would be a tremendous learning experience for our students. We thank Howard and Rob for their thankfulness and generosity in initiating this lecture series back in 2016. Tonight's guest lecturer certainly exemplifies the distinguished leaders Howard and Rob had in mind when they established mm. this series. Lieutenant General Richard C. Harding was the highest ranking attorney in the U.S. Air Force. As a Judge Advocate General, he served as the legal advisor to the Secretary of the Air Force and all officers and agencies of that military branch. That is a military branch, the Air Force, General. <laughs> This was checking. <laughs> and uh, in that position, he led over 4,400 uniformed and civilian lawyers, paralegals, and legal support personnel. In this leadership role, General Harding oversaw military justice, operational and international law, and civil law functions at every level of command. He was actually in the underground facility near Omaha, Nebraska, when our nation's leaders were determining how to respond to the 9-11 terrorist attack on our country. He is a third generation military, the son of an Air Force officer, the grandson of a naval officer, holds a law degree from the University of Arkansas. And General Harding is no stranger to Westminster. He was here to speak on campus about national security issues in 2016 and spoke this year at an Association of Churchill Fellows dinner in St. Louis. So it is my pleasure to welcome him back among his Westminster friends this evening to deliver our Cherry Price lecture. Please join me in giving a warm Westminster welcome to General Richard Hart. Yeah, if I were you, I wouldn't clap until, until you heard what I'm going to say. Um, you know, they tell you not to talk about two things in public, politics and religion. Guess what? We're going to talk about both of those things. And uh, what I want you to do, and pledge right now, please, to do it, is to, is to analyze what I have to say in an intellectual capacity and not an emotional capacity. And if you do that, I think it's going to bring you to a kind of a happier place. Um, I grew up overseas. My dad was a military officer in the United States Air Force as well an ex-Marine, uh, actually you're never an ex-Marine, a Marine that just, uh, went to the Naval Academy and uh, didn't like ship duty that much and decided to go to this new force called the Air Force. And uh, so I spent my formative years overseas in uh, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, and uh, Lebanon, back when Afghanistan used to be the safe place to go. Um, <clears throat> and those were very informative uh, for what happened after years later when I joined the Air Force in, uh, gosh, um, 1979, and uh, was able to, in, after 9-11, say, here's something about the thinking of the people that you're fighting right now. Because the ones we're fighting right now used to be our allies, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, um, uh, the Pashtun people, very, very friendly. Um, and their beliefs are more cultural than they are religious. And, uh, and it's awfully important to understand how your enemy thinks. Uh, I have a hard time calling them the enemy today because I grew up with many of them, and a lot of them are my role models when I was 11, 12, 13. Um, <clears throat> and they taught me a lot about honor and, and about what it means to stand tall. And uh, so I... I, I really regret, and if I have any heartache over the current war, it's, it's the fact that um, uh, they're on the other side of this equation. What I will tell you later is it's really not a religious war at all. It's what we call an insurgency, and what we're trying to fight is a counterinsurgency, and it's all about who owns power in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a, a country that was uh, formed by the British by a fellow by the name of Duran who drew a line and he said, this is the line of demarcation between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Why did he draw it there? He drew it there because he recognized that that was the end of the British Empire's capacity to defend. Anytime they went north of that line, it didn't work well. Well, he divided the Pashtun people in two. 
So half of them are in Pakistan and the other half are in Afghanistan, and that explains a lot of what we're seeing today. So when they get beat up, where do they recover? They go to Pakistan, to their cousin's house uh, in, the, in the federated territories in, uh, in Pakistan. So if you understand the, the, the region and you understand their culture, Pushtun Wali, which says, I give all kinds of things to the stranger. Uh, I will give the stranger uh, who is in need of aid, absolute aid. I'll give him the shirt off my back. And I've seen this in practice. I will do everything for that person. But the other side of this yin and yang is that if that person injures any member of my family, they are my eternal enemy. So if you understand the the cultural aspects of this that predate Islam by about 1,500 years, you'll understand part of their thinking. What I thought we'd do today is start on 9-11 uh, on uh, because everything changed from that day forward. And a lot of what I'm going to say may sound critical of what we've done, but you know what? After 35 years of service, I guess I get to be a little critical. I guess I earned the right. Um, also, I was promoted because I was critical. When I made Colonel, I thought, well, that's it. I'm done, and now I can really unleash my inner self and my inner feelings. And the more I did that, the more I got promoted. Good on the Air Force. You know, they recognize that that's awfully important. So if today I sound a little critical about where we are and how we got there, recognize that that's, that's just me talking truth to power, which is what you should do as well. And in an academic environment, you ought to recognize that that's awfully important. So let's talk about a uh, little bit about 9-11. You know, it was what, almost 18 years ago, 18 years next September, 17 years and some change now. And, and on that particular day, a Tuesday, we were in an exercise in Omaha, Nebraska, where I was assigned and many others were as well, in a place called Strategic Command. And we were doing a large-scale exercise where we moved submarines and we moved B-52 bombers, a multi-million dollar exercise, day two. And, and if you're like me, you live for that kind of day because that's what you've studied, that's what you can practice in an exercise and get even better at what it is you do. So I, it was 12-hour shifts, 24-7, uh, so I reported for my shift, the day shift, I'm the boss, so I get the day shift. <laughs> I went into the day shift and at 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, got my coffee, my morning ritual, looked at the newspaper, saw that Big Red, uh, University of Nebraska football team was doing well, the economy not so much. But that was okay. And I sat down with my coffee and about 40 minutes into the exercise, the support battle staff behind us, and it's kind of a room like this. It's buried deeply underground at a classified depth beyond a bomb blast uh, ability to collapse. And the support battle staff is, is back on that wall, if you were in this facility, but it's a two-story tall wall with plexiglass. And the front wall has eight movie screens like this, but four on the top, four on the bottom, that we populate with data as we go through the exercise. Support battle staff in the back keyed up their mic. There are 20 of us in the room. Four-star admiral sits square, center row, front. And the support battle staff said, sir, we have an actual. And the admiral said, all right, put it on the screen. And on the screen, we saw over those eight movie screens, uh, the uh, World Trade Center, the first attack, American Flight 11, into the North Tower. And we looked at that, and we took a, a breath. And the chatter in the room was along the lines of, um, gee, that's a big airplane. That's a big hole. How did that happen on a clear day? Where was the co-pilot if the pilot had troubles? Why, why, that's aviation discipline. Half of us were Air Force, the other half largely Navy. Where was the co-pilot? The Admiral said, all right, break, break, back to the exercise. We'll let the people in DC worry about this. We're gonna go continue with the exercise. About 30 minutes later, support battle staff said, sir, we have another actual. And he said, put it on the screen. The Admiral said, on the screen. We put it on the screen and we could see the replay of, um, of uh, United Flight 175 impact the South Tower. And it was as if the oxygen was sucked out of the room. Everyone knew what that meant. No, no chatter for some time. And then the Admiral said, cancel the exercise. We're gonna go in support of the National Military Command Center that's resident in the Pentagon. 
He asked the support battle staff in the rear, he said, are you picking up any chatter on the comms? Meaning, do you hear anything on the communication net? If STRATCOM does one thing wonderfully, and it does many things uh, superbly, the one thing it does the best is maintain national security or communication system in the event of a, a large scale emergency like this. And they said, yes, yes, Admiral, we're picking up a lot of chatter. He said, pipe it in and you see all these lights in here. Well, pretend that they were in fact speakers, which is what we had. And, and we heard immediately um, Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld, Vice President Cheney. We heard the Cheyenne Mountain Operations Center. We heard the FAA. We heard the National Military Command Center. And they were all talking about, what do we do? You know, what's going to happen next? Um, it was clear that they were looking at a number of hijacks. The Admiral said, put on the screen all the potential hijacks. We had 10 on there. Um, you know, history would show that four of those were actual and the other six were kind of fog of war stuff. We had some interesting people, pilots doing interesting things. When we told all the aircraft uh, coming from the, uh, uh, the western part of the country and the eastern part of the country to turn back and return to their home stations if they could, some of them diverted to Canada. I remember one Korean airliner <laughs> thought we were telling him to, to hit his hijack squawk button, which he did do, which got him on the list. Um, but we were tracking all of those folks and trying to sort all of that out. And then the support battle staff said, sir, we've got another actual. And he said, put it on the screen. And we saw American Flight 77 uh, impact um, of the Pentagon. Most of us had been assigned to the Pentagon. The office that I had had uh, just a few years earlier ceased to exist on that morning uh, when 77 hit the side of the building. Uh, Admiral said, put on the screen what the uh, a, a floor plan of the Pentagon. I need to know what's been hit, what's down, and he did. And we knew that you know, there are concentric rings in the Pentagon, that it had gone through three rings, and that that was largely Army territory. And so we gave our condolences to the uh, few Army brothers and sisters that were in the command center with us that day. And then uh, a truly unusual thing occurred. You see the phone that sits on next to the Admiral's uh, uh, duty station. Is, uh, is the phone that connects him to the Secretary of Defense and to the President of the United States. And in the past, in exercises, we always had actors that played those roles. So when he picked up the phone, he was talking to the exercise president or the exercise sec def. Phone rang. It wasn't supposed to ring because we weren't in an exercise any longer. He had canceled the exercise. It rang, he picked it up, he cuffed it, he walked away, had a very short discussion put it down, looked at us and said, the president will be here in one hour, prepare to brief the president. And we were thinking, what do we brief the president on? You know, the 10 hijacks? And he made it clear on all his options. So we're thinking, okay, we know where this came from. This came from uh, overseas. Uh, Al Qaeda was well known to us. So we all started to prepare our briefs, excuse me. There was an intel officer in the back. He screamed out, how do you spell Al-Qaeda? You know, there's about five or six different ways to spell Al-Qaeda. We didn't know, and we didn't have great internet capabilities, you know, in 2001. To, so maybe the best work I did that day was to tell him, you know, maybe it doesn't matter because I'm not sure the president can spell it either, but spell it consistently. <laughs> you know, whatever you do, don't change the spelling in the briefing. So we spelled it consistently wrong, but it was, it was consistent. Um, and as we're going through this process, um, the loudspeaker started to project some dialogue about what was going on with some other aircraft. And we heard the duty officer back in the Pentagon at the National Military Command Center say, sir, addressing the vice president, what do we do about United 93? Sir, what do we do about uh, the other un unidentified bogey airmen speak for an aircraft that doesn't respond to a hail? What do we do? It's entering the NCR, National Capital Region. Vice President said, uh, where's 9-3 going? Back to the NCR. Uh, what do we do, sir, says the duty officer. Vice President said, take them out. Okay, so I wrote down take them out and the time, the Greenwich Mean Time, uh, because I knew that was going to be important. The duty officer back at the Pentagon responded as he has been trained to do, and we all were trained to do this, clarify the order. What does take him out mean? So he said, so he said uh, to the uh, 
vice president. He said, would that be the president's order to shoot down United 9-3? With um, a little irritation in the vice president's voice, and I found out later he'd had this discussion with others a few times before, which explains his irritation. Um, he said, yes, take them out. So I wrote down, take them out, and I was looking at the Greenwich Mean Time again to write down the time. The guy next to me is the uh, director of staff for the, co for the command. Hot mic, you know, mics are on. He turns to me, eyeball to eyeball, sweat pouring down both of our brows, and he says, can we do that? Can we do that? See, everything changed on 9-11. Nobody thought about shooting down an airliner. Can we do that? Contemplate the unthinkable. There are possibly 200 innocent souls on United 9-3. They're not enemy combatants. Can we do that? We found out that there were actually 40 on there. It was an early morning flight. I'm not sure how much that matters, 40, 200. There are innocent souls on 9-3. Can we do that? Who are you going to call, if you want to paraphrase Ghostbusters, who are you going to call when nobody's home? They had evacuated all our backup. The Joint Staff Legal Community for me was gone. They were out in the yard somewhere in front of the Pentagon. State Department evacuated earlier that day. And you know what? Even if, we had even if they were there and we could call them, we have no time. You got 15 minutes before your 9-3 is going to be over the NCR. What's the target? Well, it was clear it was either the Capitol or the White House. We figured it was the Capitol. Why? Because it's hard to find the White House from the air. There's a lot of big trees. So we figured, well, this one must, must be headed for the Capitol. Maybe the one that hit the Pentagon, its primary target might have been, might have been the White House and its secondary the Pentagon. We didn't know. I'm not sure how much that matters. But we were asked, can we do that? And at the end of the day, you know, the analysis that you have to give, and college students particularly ought to pay attention to this, is that sometimes all you have is what you brought. Your training, your education, your experience, your judgment, but that's all you have. And uh, there are times when you are required to stand and deliver on your education and on that experience, and that was one of those times. Now, when I've told this story, uh, I have never said what my answer was going to be. And guess what? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> and there's a reason why. Because the question, can we do that, is more important than the answer. It's more important than the answer. I will tell you the rest of the story. Jets were scrambled out of Langley in southern Virginia. They hit afterburner. They scrambled to get up there. But by the time they got up there, there was nothing but a smoking hole in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And they flew over it. They didn't tell us back in that command center. In the command center, we heard the FAA, when requested by um, uh, the uh, uh, East Coast uh, uh, Air National, or um, uh, uh, NORAD, uh, the, the Northern Air Command, uh, what's the status of 9-3? They said it's down. Um, you know, NORAD said, what does down mean? Did it land? No, it's down. And then everybody knew what that meant. Um, it was below the radar level. Big jets don't fly well at that level in the grass, and, um, and, and we lost 9-3. So I gotta tell you, the people back in the command post, we thought we shot it down <laughs> for about three days until somebody explained to us that didn't happen. So that was the first challenge on 9-11. Now when the president came, you had to figure out what is this, what just happened? Was that war or was that law enforcement? There's a big difference between those two. Is it a crime or is it an act of war? Can it be both? Sure. Why, why does that make a difference? Because if it's war, once we cross that threshold and we say that's the enemy, Al-Qaeda, then we can attack Al-Qaeda wherever they exist, regardless of whether they're offering force or resistance at the time we attack. They are the enemy. They're an enemy combatant and a lawful target. If it's law enforcement, we have to apprehend, and we can only use deadly force if they attempt to resist at the time with deadly force. So when you say it's war and not law enforcement, it becomes more permissive. You can use more force. The election at that day by the president was this is war. Interestingly enough, Al-Qaeda had attacked us three times before, 93 in the World Trade Center, 
the, the bomb in the, uh, in the parking garage, where they attempted to knock one tower into another and it didn't work. 1998, uh, the embassy in Tanzania and Kenya. Yours truly was sent to Kenya after that to, to deal with part of that. In 98, that was an Al-Qaeda attack. We used law enforcement. We attempted to apprehend. In 2000, the USS Cole in the port of Aden in um, Yemen uh, attacked by a boat bomb. And we largely used um, uh, uh, law enforcement. We said, all of those are crimes and, and necessitate a law enforcement um, uh, response. In 2001, we said, this is war. Now, what's the difference between those three or four instances? Not much except the number of casualties, but we opted for war. Now, what we understand today is it can indeed be both. So when we catch members of Al Qaeda in the United States, we don't go out and kill them like they're enemy combatants, even though they don't offer resistance. The only time you can't kill an enemy combatant is when they ask for quarter, when they, when they attempt to surrender. Otherwise, you can shoot them in their sleep. We don't do that in the United States, we use law enforcement. And I think that's a very correct decision to use law enforcement and, and use the judiciary to try those folks for whatever their offenses might be. But overseas, we use the law of war. But not everywhere. We don't use it in Europe, do we? How many drones have we flown over Paris and dropped bombs on, on uh, enemy combatants? Rhymes with hero, none. Why? Because they're a robust legal system and we rely on the gendarmes in, in France to take care of that kind of an issue. So, but early on in 2001, we thought, it, we thought they were mutually exclusive. It can be one, but it can't be the other. We have to pick one. And it took us about seven years to figure out it can be both. And today we actually use, use both regimens. So I'm gonna talk about a lot of things that occurred after 9-11. But every one of these, trust me, began with the same question, can we do that? And, um, and once, you, uh, once you understand that these are all issues of first impression, then this gets a lot easier. First thing we had to do was kind of name what it, who the enemy was. Who's the enemy? I mean, Al-Qaeda, clear. But the administration at the time decided to put its hands around more than just Al-Qaeda wanted to put its hands around all terrorists. So we created a rubric called the War on Terror. And those of us that practice international law said, well, that's kind of hard because I can't define who the enemy is. Are we at war with the uh, Irish Republican Army? Are we at w war with um, domestic terrorists, you know, in the United States, some of the militia that we've had to face before? What about the Red Brigade? What about um, Bader Meinhof in Germany? All of those folks are terrorists of one sort or another. And then we have terrorists that we kind of liked in, in Afghanistan, the Mujahideen. The Russians considered them terrorists and we armed them. Uh, yes, they were not in uniforms. They did not look like normal combatants. And yes, they did occasionally use instruments of terror. And then somebody said, well, a terrorist is any, any group, armed group that um, has a political motive in mind. War is politics by other means. War is what happens when the political negotiations, you know, the diplomacy breaks down. War is always has a political end. A medal was, um, uh, was uh, issued. And I've, got, I've got one that says the GWAT medal, Global War on Terrorism. Well, what we did was we went to Afghanistan. Later we diverted over to uh, Iraq in, in 2003, but it was all based on this notion that we're fighting terrorism. There's a problem with fighting terrorism. It's a metaphorical war. You know, we fought other metaphorical wars before. Uh, 1960s, we had a war on poverty. Okay, Lyndon Johnson said, President Johnson said, we're gonna have a war on poverty. 1970, we had uh, a war on crime. Uh, uh, Richard Nixon said, we're gonna fight crime, we're gonna be tough on crime, war on crime. 1980s, uh, Nancy Reagan said, there's a war on drugs. Just say no. How did all those wars work out? Have we won any of them? And now we've got a war on terror, which is actually a war on a tactic and not on an identifiable group of people. Terror has been a tactic since the beginning of time. You can go back and in ancient history, find plenty of examples of this. Um, it is what a poor man uses as a weapon 
when they're outgunned by another power. The United States has wonderful uh, military capabilities. We've got tanks that Al-Qaeda will never be able really to successfully defeat, even with IEDs, improvised explosive devices. We've got fifth generation aircraft that they'll never be able to reach, that they don't have an air force. What they do have is terror. So if you declare war on a tactic, you've got a problem. You're probably not gonna win that war. Eventually, we figured this out five or six years later, and we don't talk about the war on terror anymore. Under international law, you can initiate war if you're acting in self-defense. Think about Pearl Harbor, Japanese attack, December 7, 1941, we, we respond, and the United States enters World War II. Responding to an act of, in self-defense. You can respond in anticipatory self-defense, and in the nuclear age, we used to talk about first strike capability. If, if we see that the Soviets are arming their missiles and they're moving their mobile missiles out, and it looks like they're on the hair trigger ready to launch, we could launch first. That's called anticipatory self-defense. International law says that's appropriate. That's authorized as a, a basis to begin war. But, excuse me, but um, in, after 9-11, we kind of created a new category, a preemptive war. And that's how we got to Iraq. We said, wouldn't it be terrible if the first time we were attacked, um, you know, visibly you could see a mushroom cloud. You heard that several times. Um, Condoleezza Rice talked about the mushroom cloud. So we went over to Iraq looking for WMD. Not surprisingly, it didn't exist. That was a preemptive war. A preemptive war is one where, you know, the, the enemy has an evil intent, may not have the capacity today, but someday soon will. So let's go get them now. Those are scary wars because there's an unending list of people that don't necessarily like us. There's lots of evil in the world. But that evil may never have the capacity to actually strike the United States. So if there's a lesson learned from Iraq, it's that. Um, it's that you, know, you wait until you really do have an imminent threat and not just some threat in the future that may, uh, may materialize or may not materialize. Um, and we moved all our forces out of Afghanistan to go fight in Iraq, and by the time we got back to Afghanistan, the, the uh, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban that were their, um, not mentors, but uh, their hosts in Afghanistan, the, the only government in Afghanistan in 2001, had grown even stronger. And today, um, we, they occupy more territory than they did after the first six months that, after we arrived in Afghanistan, which is kind of a sad commentary on how that war is going, but we're on that uh, in, in, a, in a bit. And then the other thing we learned is this. How is it that we arrive at 17 years of war in Afghanistan? The United States has never fought a 17-year war. American Revolution, eight years, and that was a long war. Uh, you know, our American Civil, our, you know, uh, War of 1812, little, about two years in, in duration. Didn't work out real well for us, but two years in duration. Uh, Mexican-American War, a little less than two years. Civil War, four years. You can go through all the wars, World War, World War I, 18 months, World War II, four years, and then we get to Afghanistan, it's 17 years, and <laughs> there's no one in this room, I believe, that, doesn't recognize that it's gonna to get to its 18th year and probably go beyond that. So how is it that we're there for 17 years? And I would posit this, there's a perfect storm of apathy when it comes to Afghanistan. And I get to say this, but others that are on active duty don't get to say this. All the leadership in the country have different reasons for really not drilling down hard on what's going on in Afghanistan. Um, if you're the president, and I don't put this at any one particular political party, but if you're the president of the United States, you may not be the one that wants to leave and appear to have left in defeat in Afghanistan until there's perfect victory, and there may never be perfect victory. If you're the Congress, you don't want to vote up a war. They did in 2001. They gave us an authorization to use military force for those people that brought us 9-11, translated the Taliban and al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan are largely gone. There's some, 
successor organizations there, but uh, they're largely gone. The Taliban are still running around. But Congress hasn't re-examined whether or not 17 years is too long. They won't even tell you 50 years is too long or 100 years is too long. You know, there's examples in history where, where other countries or empires found themselves in this kind of a position. Hadrian's Wall in England, it was manned for 300 years and eventually got overrun by those Scottish picks that came down and decided that they wanted to move south eventually, and they did. Uh, the Roman Empire fought border, wa border wars for years. Never decided how can we end this and, and kind of come to coexist with our, with our uh, past enemies. So here we have an Office of the Presidency won't take large action on this. Congress won't take large action on this. The courts call it a political question when it comes to their attention. Political question is a legal doctrine that says we don't have to judge this because we really believe that it belongs in the legislature. And that's what they've said in the past. And the American people, that's kind of our fourth branch. Um, although unstated, they don't have a, you know, an article in the Constitution. But the American people don't generally like long wars. In Vietnam, they demanded that we get out of Vietnam. But there's a difference between Vietnam and this. When Afghanistan is a pile of rocks, that's not the difference. The difference is this. In, in Vietnam, we had a draft. And sons and daughters went over there when, they were, uh, when their draft numbers came up. Involuntarily, they went. And they fought. And moms and dads were worried about their sons and daughters and insisted that the government be held to account and explain why the strategy in Vietnam didn't seem to be working. That's no longer true. Draft ended in 1973. Those that raise their hand and say, send me now under the all-volunteer force, they go over there not once. In Vietnam, it was one and done. You went over one time, you didn't have to go back again unless you volunteered. The guys that are over there now, men and women, uh, many are on their uh, fourth, fifth, sixth deployment. And the eye care factor among those in the community of parents out there isn't as high as it was in Vietnam because your son and daughter don't, won't have to go if they don't volunteer. And I don't want to mean to, mean to be too pejorative, but it's, it's real easy to send somebody else's kid to war. It's too easy. So we've been there 17 years and it's not a mistake. That's not happenstance. It's because of our environment, that perfect storm of, I think, apathy when it comes to this. No one's asked, what is the strategy in, in Afghanistan? You know what the strategy is? And it's <laughs> the last commander over there, Nicholson, the Army four star said, you man me well enough not to lose, but not well enough to win. So all I can do is, is try to draw a stalemate here. But how long are we willing, willing to engage in a stalemate? Like, like the uh, Roman Empire, two, 300 years? At what point in time was the, the investment too much? And then to make it even more interesting, uh, when I was in the Pentagon in 2012, I was asked by the general counsel for the Department of Defense, Jay Johnson, who later became uh, Homeland Security Secretary, to come down to his office. He said, I'm gonna give this speech at Harvard. Neither Jay or I had gone to Harvard Law, but he was gonna make a speech at Harvard Law. The Obama administration liked setting policy through speech making. So he said, I want you to read this. And immediately my antenna went up, why do you want me to read this speech? You know, you've never asked me to read a speech for, that you're going to deliver. In the, so I knew there was something in there that he was worried about. So I read through it, and it talked about when you go to war with an authorization from Congress, like the war in Afghanistan with an authorization to use military force against those people that brought us 9-11, you're also allowed to fight the associated forces. I'd never seen that term before. So after I read the speech, I told Jay, this doesn't make any sense. And he said, well, um, there's a Harvard Law Review that said that there's, there's historical examples. Well, what historical example? Well, there's one, and that was um, Operation Torch, North Africa, World War II, where the Vichy French, the French that were collaborating with the Nazi occupiers in France, uh, the French that occupied Algiers and Morocco um, and Tunisia, that area of North Africa, um, were uh, designated enemies by uh, the invading force in 1942, which would have been Eisenhower and his forces. Patton was in that group as well. We hit three ports in 1942 in North Africa. 
But those of us that study military history know that Harvard Law Review got it wrong because they were told to hold fire until fired upon because the French were our allies, allegedly. At least the free French were. We weren't sure what the Vichy French were gonna do. Hundreds of army troops were killed in the port of Algiers because we held fire until fired upon and troop ships were sunk in that port. So back to Jay Johnson, Jay, that, that's not accurate history. What are you gonna do about this associated force piece? And he said, well, then I'm not gonna talk about history, but he talked about associated forces anyway. That is not an international law, a respected or authorized reason for going to war. But what that does is it opens up a whole cast of characters that, are, that you don't have authorization to go to war against. It allows you to go to Syria to go to war, to Libya to go to war, to Yemen to go to war, to Mali to go to war. And we've been in all of those places without congressional authorization because they're associated forces. And again, that's something that international law doesn't recognize. Um, so uh, the concern that some of us would have is not only do we not have congressional authorization, but because we didn't get congressional authorization, um, <clears throat> The result is that we don't have a vetted strategy, you know, in any of those places. The one that causes me still to grin to this day is when I asked the question when we were going into Libya flying against Gaddafi. You know, that was an Air Force operation. Um, the answer from the administration at that time was, um, it's, it's not a war. Well, why isn't it a war? Because there are no boots on the ground. Well, tell that to the airmen that are being shot at when they fly over you know, Benghazi and other areas of, Li of Libya. It's a war, but um, all in an effort to try to expand uh, the blast radius of the, of the, war, against, uh, the war against terror. Detention. When we uh, started policing up bad guys, what do you do with the bad guys? So a decision was made early on, put them at Guantanamo Bay. Why? Because it's outside the jurisdictional limits of the United States. Why? because the courts won't give them habeas rights down there. Habeas corpus is the right to demand from the jailer some justification as to why this person is jailed. And the belief was if it's in Cuba, then it's not in the United States and what, what federal court's gonna take on Cuba? We, uh, many of us said, well, that's, you know, um, you're on thin ice there. Uh, I think what we need to do immediately is tell the American people that under international law, that you, when you police up a bad guy, that person can stay in detention until the end of the conflict. And if this is truly a global war and Al Qaeda moves around like whack-a-mole from country to country, they may never get released because we're still at war with that non-state actor. Um, for whatever reason, we didn't tell the American people that. And we put them in Guantanamo, and the Supreme Court has said a couple of times since then that they have habeas rights in Guantanamo. Why? Because the United States exercises so much authority over Guantanamo Bay that it is as if it's part of the continental United States. Um, so that exclusive right of authority meant that uh, habeas applied, which meant that the folks at Guantanamo had to explain why these people were in confinement. Well, here's an ugly fact. When you're in the battle zone and you pick up somebody, a bad person, and nobody's wearing a uniform, it's hard to tell who's Al-Qaeda and who's somebody's cousin. So you pick them all up and you try to sort it out later. And in Afghanistan, we sorted out some that didn't appear to be terribly bad and we sent them home. As a matter of fact, we brought their elders in and the elders promised to make sure that they, you know, walk the straight and narrow in the future and didn't fight against us. Some of them were what we call $5 a day Taliban. They were paid $5 a day, which is big money in Afghanistan. But they weren't necessarily wedded to the philosophy of the Taliban or Al-Qaeda. So when um, habeas corpus rights applied to Guantanamo, we had hundreds that we didn't have a really good storyline to explain why we knew that they were a member of the enemy force. And of course, all of them were saying I was just visiting my cousin. Um, so it became a problem with the burden of proof, and a lot of them were uh, repatriated. So there are much, many fewer in Guantanamo today. Strategy in Afghanistan. Strategy there, again, is not to lose, but it's not a strategy to win. 14,000 troops there. We're fighting an insurgency. 
counterinsurgency doctrine based on history and a lot of study says that in order to fight a counterinsurgency, you need a few things. You need to secure the population center. You can't centers. You can't do that in Afghanistan with 14,000 troops. You need much more, maybe 100,000 more. You need to have a credible government that the people can look to and support. That hasn't always been true in Afghanistan. There's been levels of corruption that have been problematic there. You need to stop support from the outside. Pakistan supports elements of Pakistan, not necessarily its full government, but elements of Pakistan support uh, the Taliban on the other side of the border. And that's difficult. You cannot defeat an insurgency when they have that level of support. And lastly, you need to give it time. So you have to tell the American people, this could take 10 to 20 years with force levels of about 100,000. And then maybe we'll have a viable government that can stand on their own. Today, our approach is trying to train the Afghan National Police and the Afghan um, Army. I visited those schools. I put my people in those schools to teach ethics and, and um, uh, morals, essentially. And they, they did a good job. And they explained it in terms of Sharia law and in terms of secular law and in terms of just social contract. Wouldn't it be a great place if you, you didn't have to worry about your mother being the victim of theft or assault? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing for Afghanistan? And they all said yes, but over the years, 17 years of training the ANP and the ANA, things haven't gotten any better. And part of the problem is, is Afghanistan never was a homogeneous country. Alexander the Great went there, didn't work out well for him. He tried to marry his way through there. Roxanne, his wife, was um, uh, from one of the Afghan tribes. That didn't work. He still had problems. British went there and got their nose uh, bledded uh, pretty hard. You go through the Khyber Pass today, you're going to see plaques on the sides of that Rock Mountain Pass to British units that were all but wiped out and some were wiped out. Soviets went there and that didn't work for them. I'm not going to say it's the graveyard of empires as other people have said, but it is a hard place to win a war. So if we're not willing to spend 100,000 troops for 10 to 20 years and somehow block that level of support from Pakistan, this isn't going to get any better. We won't lose, but we won't win. Now, when I uh, gave this talk, Tim Riley, the um, executive director at the museum, said, I want you to talk about what Churchill would do. And I did, and he kind of liked it, and he sent me another email, um, uh, President Lampkin. He said, please, please talk about Churchill again. <laughs> so, and I feel duty bound, but uh, you know, Churchill had an existential enemy. He was all alone on an island looking at all likelihood defeat. Um, and, and there was no doubt there was no compromise with this enemy, although he had people that wanted him to compromise. Um, with his back against the wall, he made some decisions that a lot of us don't talk about much today. He made a decision to bomb the city of, um, of Germany. Uh, international law says in the principle of discrimination, one may not target civilians. He targeted civilians. He thought that would demoralize the Germans. It actually had the opposite effect, but nobody had seen that before. And in the United States, 8th Air Force did the same mission, but by day. We did it by day because we thought, you know, you can see the target, and while gravity bombs generally don't hit the target, one out of 100 might, uh, even if it's in a population center. The British did it at night when you frankly couldn't really see anything other than the city area that was lit up with incendiary weapons. Churchill. Um, uh, during the Battle of Britain, um, refused to give quarter to uh, German pilots that were bailing out over the channel. Why? Because pilot production was better in Germany than it was in Great Britain. And he couldn't win a war, an air war, if he had to shoot the same pilot down twice, because they could continue to crank out Messerschmitts, and the British couldn't keep up that line of production quite as well. But that's because his back was against the wall. And the question today is, is our back against the wall, to the point where we need to come up with a doctrine that talks about associated forces to expand our ability to fight wherever we want to fight, that we expand the, the doctrine of, or the justification to go to war to include preemptive wars. And I would posit that our back is not quite against the same wall that Churchill's back was. The threat has changed. Um, and, and, and while we're fighting a non-state actor that moves around the planet, that doesn't mean that we need to abdicate rules. Let me give you the big, biggest example of a uh, problematic uh, issue, I think, for all of us. 
Anybody heard of, of targeted killing before? Targeted killing, yeah, a few. The idea behind targeted killing is you're, you're gonna engage an enemy not in the traditional battle zone. So maybe it's Al-Qaeda, but it, these Al-Qaeda's not in, that particular body of Al-Qaeda's not, uh, not in Afghanistan, it's in Somalia, or it's in Libya, or maybe Mali. And those countries aren't willing to um, arrest and, 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 uh, and hand over uh, those members. So what, what does one do? Well, you send a predator over with the Hellfire missile and you take that person out uh, or people out. There was perhaps the most famous case was 2011, a fellow by the name of Anwar Alaki. Anybody ever heard of Anwar? Anwar um, was a U.S. citizen born in this country. His father was uh, a visiting uh, student. And while he was uh, going through his university studies in the United States, Anwar was born. Anwar after 9-11 was uh, vehemently opposed to Al-Qaeda. Served as an Amman in a, a mosque in uh, a Falls Church, Virginia. Anwar, however, had kind of a shady personal life and frequented brothels and whatnot. And uh, the FBI was kind of looking at anybody that might be a little sketchy and possibly a member of Al-Qaeda, so they started to look at Anwar. Anwar found out about it because his best friend was interviewed by the FBI, and as soon as he was done with his interview, his best friend called Anwar and said, hey, they're after you. So Anwar beat feet to Yemen. And over in Yemen, he became radicalized, and he ran a, a magazine called Inspire Magazine, which was Al-Qaeda's uh, magazine, used largely for recruiting. Anwar never fired a weapon, that we know of. There's no evidence that he ever did that. He did take his picture next, next to an automatic weapon that was frankly almost as big as he was. So if he ever fired it, it would have probably kicked him into the dirt pretty quickly. Uh, the second edition of Inspire magazine uh, was entitled How to Build a Bomb in Your Mother's Kitchen. The Tsarnaev brothers used that manual to build pressure cooker bombs in the, uh, in the Boston Marathon bombings. So Anwar had an impact on the battle zone, but he wasn't a combatant. He got on the kill list, approved by the president, um, to use uh, uh, targeted killing, and was killed by an airstrike uh, uh, using a, a drone, a predator. Um, six weeks later, his son, 16-year-old, Abdul Muttalib um, Alaki, was looking for his father in Yemen and was killed by a second airstrike that we now call signature strikes. And to me, it's, I, kind of, I like using the duck rule. If it, walks like a duck, talks like a duck, you know, looks like, it's a duck. So the, that rule says, if it looks like bad guys in transit, you can shoot them. Anwar's father, Nasser Alaki, went to the US court system and said, my son, before, before Anwar Alaki was killed, my son is being targeted and has been given basically a death sentence, but no due process. He hasn't been to court, wasn't charged with a thing, wasn't adjudicated, found guilty of anything, wasn't sentenced to death, yet he's on this kill list. That's a denial of due process, Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments, due process rights. The court said, you know what, um, father of, <laughs> of, uh, of Alaki, you don't have standing to make that complaint. If your son comes in here, we'll listen to him. After Anwar was killed, denied, having been denied uh, a court remedy, uh, Father Alaki, um, Nasser Alaki, went back into U.S. court and said, um, with basically a wrongful death action, my son was killed, it was wrongful. We want some recompense. The court said at that point, you know what, this is a political question and we're not going to adjudge this. So there's the court saying, we're not going to deal with this. Here's the United States saying we're going to exercise this kind of a remedy called targeting killing. And then my concern and your concern ought to be, how does the rest of the world view this? I'm not going to, let's not worry about is that right or wrong. How do they view it? How do they perceive that killing? And then you ask yourself, why did the Russians, how could they get away with killing journalists outside their, their own territorial or their own sovereign territory? How do the Saudis get away with killing uh, Jamal Khashoggi, um, you know, in Turkey? Even though the killing actually occurred on, technically on, on Saudi sovereign territory inside their embassy. How do they get away with that? 
And the real question that ought to be asked is, what do they perceive the United States to have done? We used to be, and should always be, uh, the leader of, um, by actions, not just words, of human rights in, in the international community. We ought to demand that of others. And when we fail uh, you know, on our own accord, don't be surprised if others take lessons learned from that. So, um, you know, my bottom line, and I'll leave you, leave you with, this, with this final thought. Um, you know, <laughs> there, there, there is still a dream called America. And we are the big dog on the block. And we have a leadership responsibility when we go overseas. We win when we fight with our values. When we abandon those values, we begin to chip away at what we're really all about. And, you know, I, I'm a big Ronald Reagan fan. You know, we are that shining city on a hill. And when the shine, the luster starts to wear off because of what we've done and we can't explain it to others. And as a matter of fact, our legal basis for uh, targeted killing was uh, surrounded by secrecy for almost a year. And then somebody in the administration leaked it. And the administration was forced to submit a white paper. And now we kind of know what their legal basis is, but it stretches international law beyond the boundaries that have been set over the course of 2,000 years. So we ought to worry about that because it sets an example that can be used against us. Let's be a little selfish about it. How much does it cost to buy a drone? You can get them at the mall. How, how difficult is it to put an explosive on a drone? Not at all. That's why we don't allow them in air shows. There was an 18-year-old that actually figured out how to put a 45 caliber pistol on a drone and stabilize the aircraft so the thing could repeatedly fire. Now, if an 18-year-old can do that, there are plenty of adversaries that can do that. How can we say that that's wrong when we've done the same thing? So the example we set is one we have to agree to live with and may be inconvenient in the long term. Short term, yeah, it's, it gets us a short term goal and it satisfies. Long term, too much pain. Harding's humble opinion. I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. If your head hurts, then I've achieved my mission. All right. <laughs> Come on, there's got to be a question out there. Yes, sir. Yeah, a lot of the uh, war on terrorism really could be resolved in a law enforcement vein, and it's never going to fully go away. And there's a strategy called counterterrorism, which says we go out and we get the terrorist, um, and maybe that's where um, targeted killing comes in. But we don't necessarily need the number of boots on the ground that we have today. Um, Afghanistan may never be settled. The Taliban are stronger than they were when, when we started over there. Um, Al Qaeda's all but gone. And maybe, maybe it's okay if Afghanistan is led by the Taliban. And I have said this so many times. I got crossways with the American Bar Association on this. They have a right for self determination. If they want to be an Islamic Republic led by the Taliban, then, uh, then that's their choice. And, uh, and, you know, not every place that we go is going to look like a little America. And sometimes we do a disservice to the cause of national defense when we try to make it look like little America. So we try to implant our idea of civil liberties over there. It's not going to work. Not in that culture. That's, they're not necessarily ready for that, nor do they want it right now. What they want is they want a stable government. I'm convinced of that, having worked with the Afghans. Um, but that stable government might very well look like a theocracy. And I guess that's kind of OK if that's what they want. Who else? Yes, sir. <laughs> um, it is difficult for the armed forces to ex ex execute any kind of a mission down there uh, for a couple of reasons. One, there's a law, 1867 or 8, I think it's 8, called Posse Comitatus Act after the Civil War and the period of Reconstruction that prohibits use of armed forces in civil law affairs, which means that we've got a lot of people standing in the dirt down there that can serve as eyes and ears but they need to call in the border patrol and the customs folks in order to execute. Um, there's a reason why most of them don't have weapons down there, because that's not what they can do. So you've got a lot of folks down there that may not have 
uh, be fully utilized, may not have really a strong mission. Um, so that's, that's my view. And, they, and, and, and it is not unfair to worry about um, the fact that they're missing holidays today. I feel really sorry for them because a lot of them that are there now are going to miss next Christmas as well or, and Thanksgiving because they're going to be in Afghanistan. Um, so this puts additional burden on military families. So if there's a real mission for them to do, send them. But I don't see the mission that's, uh, uh, that, that's, that's down there right now. I don't, I don't get that. It's complete candor. We, we, have, we promised an hour long All right. uh, lecture to the students. All right. uh, there's a reception following that's going to be in the right. atrium. If you can corner him, I'm sure he'll answer any more questions. Thank you for you bet. very, very you bet. All right. You bet. You were frowning. You, you were frowning. Thanks for coming on this cold evening. Again, reception. Frowning.